Providence Business Show. Great to have you back with us. Uh, this is uh, uh, this episode has been a, uh, one in a continuing series. Four episodes on how to buy a business. It's a big it's a big topic. <laughs> and uh, but again, welcome back to our show. Uh, I'm the co-host Bill Fox. The other co-host is the thermogenic, scintillating, and ever sagacious Coach Robbins. <laughs> Mr. Bill, how are you? <laughs> You're a regular lexicon, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I th is lexicon the right? No, I said I didn't say leprechaun. Oh, well, lexicon. I, thought you I think okay. it's somebody who's good with a dictionary. I don't know. It might <laughs> be wrong. Not my area of expertise. Well, I'm just I'm just trying to tell it like it well, is. I know I'm that. I know. I'm I am doing the Howard Cosell thing. I am perspicacious. <laughs> I don't know. As I said uh, before, we've been dealing with the topic of how to buy a business. We had part one. We talked about the decision itself to uh, enter the small business world by buying a business, by starting it from scratch, or by going the you know the franchise route. All mm. of which are valid mm -hmm. and have their own merits and demerits. Yep. Uh, we've been dealing with how to buy a business, which we think is a very valid way. And in fact, Coach has been personally involved in that mm -hmm. activity. Uh, we dealt with uh, uh, also with the uh, due diligence, uh, so-called due diligence, the investigation into all the background matters re uh, regarding the business that you're looking at. And uh, we've been talking about valuation of the business, and that's a whole area unto itself, Huge. but ex extremely important. And now we come down to part four, which is something that's referred to as, quote, structuring the deal. Mm -hmm. Coach is going to uh, explain that to us, but this is a, uh, uh, as, as valuable as all the foregoing. Oh, yeah. Structuring the deal. It's all in the deal. So let's take a look at that. Um, a couple of items that I, I'd like you to comment on, Coach, would be cash, cash versus financing or lender versus seller financing. Lender versus seller financing. Right. Okay. You've uh, done your due diligence. You, you, you looked like crazy for a business. A lot of hard work. Finding a business for sale, finding the right business for sale, and narrowing it down, a lot of hard work. You've, uh, you're interested in it. You've done your due diligence. You've worked out the uh, pricing. You're ready to write up the contract. Now you have to structure the deal. Okay. Ready to ink the deal. Ready to sign up with a red pen. I hate red. <laughs> uh, so you're looking at the deal and you say, okay, let's go back to the liquor store. Might as well stick with the liquor store. And then, then you've agreed that you're going to pay the guy $400,000 for, for the liquor store. All okay. right. All right. And now, uh, there's such a thing which we've talked about many, many times called the five C's of credit. I'm not going to go over them all, but one of the C's is called contribution. All right. A lender generally speaking, if it's a $400,000 deal, wants you to put $100,000 of your cash, plus or minus, yeah. into the purchase price. That'd be 20%. 25, right. 25%, Out of 400, me. right. Me. I dropped the price to 400 from 500, right? <laughs> okay. I, you were with me on the 500. I was on the 500 yeah, yeah, bucks, yeah. I just, okay, no, we, no, we, we negotiated well. We got it down to 400, right? Yeah. And, the lender is going to want you to put about $100,000 in. If it's 500, they might take 20%, but that's up to the different lenders. But you're going to have to put up a contribution to buy the business. And then you're going to look to the lender to loan you 70, 75%, whatever, of the purchase price for the business. Then they're going to run it through their formulas and everything else. Uh, the, the lender, uh, and we've done many, many shows about it, is looking at it from a standpoint Am I going to get paid back? Is this person going to be able to run this business and make that payment every month? They don't want, this isn't cheers, as I've said, they don't want to know your name. You just, they want to loan you the money. They want that payment to be made every month for seven years, 10 years, whatever the deal. And they want to look at it and they are not in the risk business. Banks don't take risk. Bankers get upset when I say that. They really don't. But you know what? At five, six, seven percent, they don't have a lot in there. For, bank, for failures. So they're very, very choosy and careful. Risks are for angels. Risks are for entrepreneurs. Banks, they want to look at it and say, I know I'm going to get paid based on what this guy's capability of run the business is, and I feel very comfortable if I don't, I as enough, another C, collateral, collateral that I can get my money back. Okay, to, to they just up. don't 
really take much in the way of risks, all right? Now, to get to the difference between seller uh, financing and lender financing, to go back to that, that business that uh, wink, wink, nod, nod, is showing losses every year for the last 10 years, but the guy's driving a new Cadillac Escalade every year, living in a riverfront condo, and just put his four kids through college all with cash, okay? Yeah. So in other words, he's lying and yeah. cheating and he's breaking a law. Uh, lenders are gonna go by the tax returns, okay? So a lot of times I have put a lot of deals together where you say to the seller, you haven't prepared this business for sale. If somebody doesn't have cash, 100% cash to buy this business, you can't sell it. Now, if you really want to sell the business, I have a method that you can use. You can, let's say it's the liquor store and a bank says, I'm not touching this. He's never shown a decent profit to support a $300,000 debt. You're putting up 100, you're looking to borrow 300, banks turn you down left and right, SBA won't guarantee it, whatever. You say to the owner, look it, here's what we can do. You really are a motivated seller. I'm a motivated buyer. I'll give you a $100,000 deposit, okay, down payment, excuse me. You take back paper for the $300,000, and I will buy the business for you, and you, right, right, are the guy holding the mortgage. Okay. Okay? Okay. So then, here's the tricky part. But you don't want to be here for 10 years and while I pay you off like a bank. Well, let me run this business for a couple of years. <clears throat> let me build it up, show a good track record. Your note could balloon in 30 months, for instance, and all of this is negotiable. It's, my numbers are meaningless. And at the end of two years, okay, I have two good solid years of running this business. I can go to a lender and say, see, my tax returns show I'm making good money. I need $275,000, because you paid some off, right? Yeah, right? To buy this balloon note out, which is coming due in 30 months. That's a way to structure the deal. And, and I've had many deals get structured that way with owners who weren't ready to sell their business. Uh, or there's a, uh, another uh, aspect of the uh, buying the business is uh, what's called the purchase method or purchasing me purchase <coughs> methods, excuse me, Yep. Uh, an approach to uh, structuring the deal. One is called asset purchase. Right. The other is called stock purchase. Mm -hmm. What's, the, what's, what's going on here? Okay, what's going on here is what I mentioned in a previous show, and I hope you've watched the previous shows to get caught up with this last show. Uh, and I said, personally, <clears throat> I don't want to buy your stock. I don't want to buy the equity in your company, all right? Why? Because I don't know what's hidden out there as far as potential liabilities at a future time. Uh, the due diligence is going to be much deeper for me. I had a guy, before he came to meet me, buy a business, and there were some hidden liabilities that came back to bite this guy and literally put him out of business. By the time he came, back, came in to see me, he was already dead. I mean, there was no chance of saving him because he bought the equity, the stock, the shares of the business, took right. it over, right. and it had more liabilities than it had equity, and there were hidden liabilities. Now you got all kinds of lawsuits going on. Look at it. I'm going to buy a business. I'm going to buy your liquor store, okay? I am going to buy the assets from you. I am going to buy the inventory, right? I'm going to buy the equipment. I may buy the building, and I'll buy the goodwill. I'll pay something for that profitability, all right? right? But I don't want to buy your stock, your shares, quite frankly. Now, this is me, and this is most people when it comes to buying a small business. Now, we're not talking about buying stock on the public markets where it's a huge company with thousands, or hundreds of thousands of shareholders. It's totally different when you're looking at a small business, right? right? I had several clients who were the CEOs of major corporations, but they came to me for business advice for small business because they're different. I could tell you their names, but everything I do is confidential, and if I told you the names, I'd have to shoot you. <laughs> okay. But they came to me and said, this is different, <clears throat> I know it. Cliff, help me with this small business. So asset purchase, uh, 
Not, Three, necess not necessarily, but that should get a very strong look-see if you're Absolutely. looking to buy a business. Absolutely. Is it 100%? No, but it's a big percentage of what you better be looking at. I'm buying the assets of the business, mm -hmm. and I'm starting my business, and I don't have to worry about any hidden liabilities to the other business. Yeah. Well, how about <coughs> another, another uh, aspect of this uh, uh, structuring the deal is called alternatives to cash. Mm-hmm. Such as the seller assets, uh, co-op co deals, uh, ESOP, employee stock ownership plan, uh, lease with option, and or the uh, liabilities and receivables. Yeah. Um, Can you help us with all of that stuff? You know. Alternatives to cash. Oh man, I've looked at a thousand. Businesses for sale, maybe close to 2,000 now. I remember I did a show like seven, eight years ago, and I said, I think I'm nearing 2,000 yeah. businesses. Yeah, you, yeah you did. That's right. Well, now I'm close to the, over 3,000, but I have to have looked at 1,000 deals, all right? And none of this comes up in any of those 1,000 deals to speak of. These are usually bigger companies that use the seller assets approach, the co-op approach, or the ESIP thing. I had a lot of small business people say, I would like to convert to an employer own, employee owned stock ownership program. The business is too small. It's expensive to do these things. The laws are you know, all over the place. Now, lease with option is different. That's something that has been done, that you can lease the business with an option to buy it at some time. That's possible, okay, but it's still, I haven't seen a lot of it out of the more than thousand deals that I've been involved with so buying and selling business, right? Yeah. And liabilities and receivables, I'm not even sure what they're looking for, alternatives to cash. Uh, these are things that are out there, but it's usually for much larger businesses than we deal with the one, two, three, five million dollar businesses, the really small businesses. Um, it's about money. I would say, you know, from your comments, say, be aware. Yeah. Of it's these, a possibility. Of these approaches, these yeah. are discussion points. Yeah. Possibly be aware, yeah. but don't necessarily make, no. a, make a big deal of it. No. It doesn't really apply it in, doesn't most, apply in to most cases. 95, 99% of the businesses and small business, they're, they're just All right. not real. Well, uh, help, help, let's help, help us deal with uh, another area of the, of the structuring uh, process, which is common mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> common mistakes. Uh, such as Oops. Uh, buying on price, yep. cash shortage, uh, buying all the receivables, failure to verify. Oops, that's due diligence. Heavy, heavy, uh, extra, extra heavy payments. Cash flow. And uh, something a strange item, mistreating, mistreating the seller. Yeah, uh, a lot of times, particularly, uh, you know, before you're probably not mistreating the seller because you're trying to buy the business, but afterwards sometimes you do make that stupid mistake. Look, the guy is still an important uh, distant partner, if anything else. But let's go back and, and, and talk about purely buying on price. Uh, it, it's not just a numbers game. There's a lot of, did we mention intangibles in show two? Intangibles. The importance of the intangibles of the business. The numbers are the numbers, and the numbers are important and they're critical. But there's a lot of intangible stuff that you better look at for a business. The industry uh, standards, the, uh, the local area, the employees, the customer's viewpoint, the ethics of the business. I mean, there's so many intangible issues that the price is what you pay, but you're buying a business, you better check a lot of things out on a business. Now, when it comes to cash shortage, that thing should just jump off the screen at you. Uh, cash is king. To a business. A business, a small business doesn't have a lot of extra cash, let extra assets sitting around the way a big business does. Right. You know, there's just so much that's available to a small business. And once you're out of cash, you're out of business. Now, I've told a story of how a company can grow and be very profitable in going out of business, making profit because they ran out of cash and they couldn't pay their bills. All right? yeah because they had built the business up fast, right. inventory had grown fast, receivables had grown fast, and at the end of the year, the IRS is looking for a check and you don't have any money, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because all your money's tied up in inventory and receivables and growth. Cash is critical, cash is critical. Cash is the single most important construct 
for a successful, small, sustainable business. It's about cash. All right. well, I was, when I was looking at the cash shortage, I was thinking also about the, <coughs> the buyer, if, you, if you're, you're buying this business. If you put 100% uh, into the purchase itself, mm -hmm. now you own the business, you're out of money. Yeah, but you can't run the business. It takes money I to mean, run. That's in right. a way, you say, well, I don't know about this business thing, but uh, I, I go back to the old, uh, the old analogy. If you, uh, if you buy a house, you, bu you, you just bought, a, you bought an existing house yeah. on the marketplace. Yeah. Not building a brand new one, you no. bought an existing and one. You used but you, every you, you, you just had. bought the house and you you put yourself you you laid yourself out a hundred percent. Right. And now you, you own that house, but now it needs uh, a plumbing, Carpet. electrical. Right. It oh needs, yeah, it needs something that needs. I, I don't mean elective stuff like you know re, re, re the grass or something. Right. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about stuff it needs. It, it needs uh, you know something needs, and you're out. Yeah, yeah, you're fresh out. The yeah. same thing could happen if you buy a business. It's a lot more critical than a business because at least with the house, it's a small a business. You know, hey, you know, I got so much money. I've taken a hundred percent of what I had and bought the business, but mm. now I have no cash to buy inventory. I have no cash to. You, mm. you need money. Right. Cash is king, queen, to a business, to a small business. It's all about cash flow. It's the single most important construct that you have to manage properly in a business. It's not profit. That's important. Yeah. It's cash. Can I stay in business? Now, of course, I kid people all the time and say, you can start a business, buy a business, and not worry about cash flow. Just put $10 million in the checking account. You don't have to worry about it at all for years, okay? But, you know. Uh, buying all the receivables, <coughs> failure well, to verify, heavy payments. Yeah. Well, it's still one at a time. Buying all the receivables I already addressed. I said, you're going to buy the receivables. It better be guaranteed. You're going to collect them? You want to buy a bad receivable? No. no. Okay? Right. So if you're going to put, if the, if the company has $300,000 worth of receivables and you're buying that asset, they better guarantee that you're going to collect all that. All right? right? And all of a sudden there's a debt on there for thirty grand. The guy goes bankrupt. You can't collect it. He disputes that he owes it. That comes off the purchase price, in my opinion. Buying a receivable, it better be guaranteed that you can collect it. You're buying something you should collect. Just like when you're buying inventory, it better be something you can sell. Buying a receivable, it should better be darn guaranteed and sure that you can collect it. Well, or the, or the price that you, uh, if, <coughs> if there's a price on the receivables, you, only, you pay only uh, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. Yep. You could do that value, too, uh, and you're going to take discount, the risk. Right? It's a discount. It's a discount, and you then you're taking a risk. And people buy, people buy bad debt all the time. Lawyers buy it all the mm -hmm. time. Then they let it mature over a five or ten year period, and then they go back after the owner and say, "Look, you owed this company forty thousand dollars, mm -hmm. right? You didn't pay it. Here we are, six years later. It's now sixty thousand dollars. I bought it for four thousand dollars. I'll." let you pay it off for 10 or 5 or whatever. Right. That's not all the time. Right. Yeah. And uh, this idea uh, heavy, well, heavy payments, uh, uh, you, you agree to take on hmm. payments that you really, you really can't afford. That right. was what, that's what that That is be. exactly tied to cash and cash flow or cash, cash shortage. Flow. I mean, you buy a business flow. and you say, okay, I'm borrow $300,000. I want to pay it off in three years. Right. Really? I mean, can you? I mean, it that eats a lot of cash, you know. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, you know, I'll buy the business, and I'm going to borrow the 300 for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So for three years, I got to pay, and my numbers are wrong. I'm not doing. I could do it, but I don't have time to do it. Three thousand a month, I can pay it off, you know, or fifteen thousand a month to pay it off in, you know, three years, mm -hmm. two years. Whereas if I stretch it out to the 10 years, it's only three thousand dollars a month. Okay, right. so it's a cash flow thing. It always have you noticed a common theme through everything? <laughs> it's always about cash. All right, do I have? Can I generate the cash? It's real simple. The gazintas got to be bigger than the gazautas, and the gazintas got to come in before the, the gazautas got to go out. <laughs> That's it, folks. It is not complicated. It gets more complicated when you try to put it on a piece of paper and plan for it, which you should be doing which I think is the most important exercise you can do for your business, but the gazintas got to come in bigger and faster than the gazautas got to go out. And uh, mistreating the seller, I don't know, I mean that, uh, you may want the seller, you may want 
the seller to have good, you know, goodwill. I mean, you know, cut a cut a good deal. Yeah. Barg- I mean, bargain hard. You know, yeah. cut a deal. Oh, yeah. But, but it's, don't clean, trans- it's a clean fight. the seller. Well, you, that's crazy. That's crazy to do anything like that because the seller's been running the business for 20 years. He has contacts. He has friends. You know, you're buying a continuity. When well, you buy a business, you're buying a continuity. You're starting a business that's brand new, fresh. You're buying a franchise. You're buying a business model. You're going to do it their way because they've got a successful way to do it. You buy an existing business. You're buying what this seller has been doing for 10 years, 20 years, mm-hmm. right? And so that's why a lot of deals have the seller stay on a year or two mm-hmm. as a salaried employee right. to, to build that continuity and transfer transference of power from the other guy to you. So, you know. Speaking you, of trashing the, uh, trashing the uh, seller, yeah. I don't know why it, it, it jumped into my mind. It just happens that right now in the current news cycle, there's a story running around about how Donald Trump bought a, a winery. Yeah. And if you heard the story. No, I haven't. It was, uh, I, I just jumped. Is that Trump or dump? Yeah, Trump. Trump, Trump. 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 Sorry, Donald. Uh, that, uh, according to this. Trump? According Trump. To this, oh, according Trump. to this legend. Yeah. That uh, uh, he came about, uh, uh, you know, uh, t- taking an interest in buying a winery, but ended up uh, uh, buying all the land around, surrounding the refinery, <coughs> the winery, the winery, and uh, and disallowing people, you know, c- coming and going, you know, mm. uh, to the uh, to the to the winery. Yeah. I mean, he isolated it. Yeah. Uh, that the the winery was, uh, you know, had a uh, uh, an expectation that it would be it could be sold for anywhere from thirty to forty million. Right. Ultimately, with this strangulation uh, tactic. Yeah. Uh, you know, Trump uh, uh, negotiated it down and ended up, you know, buying the, the winery for six million. Because he destroyed the business. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know anything about it, but uh, that's pretty crummy. It's, it's in the current news that's, cycle. That's, right? that's predatory. That's, 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 uh, <laughs> you think that, that seller's going to help him? I don't think so. I don't think so. But, you know, hey, I don't know. That's, I mean, quite frankly, a shame on the seller, too. I mean, he should have been able to see that, hey, wait a minute, yeah. you know, everything around me, you know, I got a nice deal that they can cross the land and come on to my property, but now what am I going to do, helicopter everything in and out? I mean, <laughs> just, come on, you got to think ahead, folks. Uh, Coach, I want to turn your, turn your attention to, uh, in, a, a, uh, in a transition period, yep. you know, between the, uh, uh, the investigation and then buying the business in a transition period. Yeah. Would it be, you know, it, it would be wise to consult with employees, vendors, and customers. Uh, it would also be wise if you're if you're the buyer to tamp down or control your expectations, yep. especially the developing of false expectation mm-hmm. and excitement. Yep. And have one of your favorites have a marketing plan. A written marketing plan well executed. What's your, what's okay, your take well, on all of this? Well, in the due diligence, we talked about it. You know, when somebody's selling a business, it's tricky. Uh, put yourself in the position of a seller. Does he want his customers to know? Maybe not. Does he want his vendors to know? Maybe not. Does he want his employees to know? Probably not. Okay. <laughs> So here he is, I want to sell something, but I don't want to let anybody know, <laughs> okay? So it's kind of a tricky thing for him to do or her to do that. But at some point before you sign on the dotted line and you've signed a letter of intent or whatever stage you are in a legal process, you do want to be able to consult with employees, all right, to make sure that particularly the good employees are going to stay. You want to buy a business, and one of the intangibles is they've got three great employees. You buy the business, and they just, they're ready to jump to a competitor. You yeah, know? Right. So that's a tricky negotiation going on there. And you really want to be able to talk to the key employees to say, look, it, uh, he's, uh, he's selling the business. I'm buying it. Let me introduce me to you. Let's have go to dinner. Uh, at some point, it's nice to be able to do that. That's for darn sure. I know I've done that in several instances where... The deal signed, right. you know, and part of the due diligence is to, on a confidentiality basis, talk to some of the employees, talk to some of the vendors that say, I'm thinking about buying the business. I want you to meet me. I want you to feel comfortable with me. Yeah. And I'd like to know, you know, if I buy the business, what is the deal going forward? Like I mentioned in one of the shows, 
when I bought it, one of the distributors that had a sweetheart deal with a manufacturer in the next town, I wanted to make sure that manufacturer was comfortable that if I bought this business. That manufacturer didn't necessarily have to provide you right, with that. Right, that I got the same deal. That was part of the profitability of this business is the sweetheart deal he had set up over yeah. a period of, God, decades with this company, yeah. you know. So, uh, yeah, it's nice to be able to talk to the, the employees, just the important ones necessarily, if not all of them, you know, at some point. I don't know if you've watched the show on TV. I watch it all the time. It's pretty good. Uh, the Profit. Uh -huh. I can talk about another show why not <laughs> he's on big tv makes a lot of money doing it but marcus lamonis that's a great show he he does his deal he's ready to negotiate and quite frankly one of the first things he does as part of due diligence is bring the owners and he to all of the employees of the business and explain here's where we're going i'm buying piece of this business and i hope to do this and hope to do that absolutely right. yeah and control your expectations yeah, and I have, mean, a, have a marketing plan. Yeah, as far as controlling expectations, I mean, you know, don't don't fall in love, you know, too too far. I mean, you fall in love, you lose your head anyway, right? <laughs> I don't know where the hell you are, right? Uh, stardust in your eyes and all that jazz. So, you know, make sure you're going into this thinking it through all the way. And you better have, have I mentioned a marketing plan? Oh, before? a couple of times. Okay, well, again, Peter Drucker. Arguably the most famous business writing teacher guru in the history of you know capitalism said job one is to create customers. How do you do that? Execute on a solid, innovative, written marketing plan. End of story. That's what you need to do. Okay. Well, thank you again for watching the Fox Robbins Business Show. Great to have you with us. And uh We'll move on from this uh, how to buy a business. This has been important. It has taken four uh, episodes to try to get a handle on that on that topic. Yep. Uh, and I hope we've done it. I hope we've done it justice. We may have to come back at a later date and and touch up on some of the topics here. Oh, this again. This if I were, I could do a whole sixteen week course at Bentley University on how to buy a business. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I could put in hundreds of hours teaching this thing. There are textbooks on it. There, yeah, there's a lot to it, and we have just skimmed along the top of the waves. We haven't even sunk into the tide. Well, thank you again for for joining us at the Fox Robbins Business Show, and uh, we'll move on from here. But it's been a lot of fun talking about this. It has been. And uh, again, we'll see you guys next time.